Okay, so it's been about a month since CERN turned on the Large Hadron Collider. And I saw a lot of posts saying things like, oh, people on TikTok are being so dramatic. And are we dramatic? Or is quantum physics dramatic? So I'm gonna tell you all the drama. Okay, so this information is coming from Dr. Kaku's book, The God Equation. Okay, so it's only been about a hundred years that quantum theory has even been a thing. Up until then, and majority of people today, believe in Newtonian physics. You know the story, Apple fell on his head, he discovered gravity, and that was it. We got locked in the matrix. So up until quantum theory, physicists had been operating on determinism. Basically, every event could be predicted with precision as long as you knew the location and the velocity. Now, you might remember in part one of the Earthshift series I did, Sir Isaac Newton believed that the world would end in 2060. Now, there's a great quote in this. Quantum theory violated common sense, and the uncertainty of it shook the world of physics. Like I said, drama. And here's where it starts to get juicy. Okay, so in 1930, at the Solvay Conference, Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr went toe-to-toe -to -toe in what is considered one of the greatest debates in all of history. Now, Einstein, he didn't like what these young kids were saying about quantum mechanics, but Bohr held his own. Einstein didn't like the uncertainty of their theories. He said, look, God doesn't play dice with the universe. He's like, well, how about you stop telling God what to do? And the audience is like, oh. And historians say that Bohr actually won the debate, but Einstein did a good job of exposing the cracks within quantum theory. Now, this conference was the Coachella lineup of physics. We got Einstein, Schrodinger, Marie Curie looking radiant. Of the 29 people in the photo, 17 of them won Nobel Prizes in physics. Okay, so now let's get a little bit more into what Niels Bohr was talking about. Now, this is considered the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which says that an atom exists in multiple states all at the same time. It's not until you interact with or observe it, it actually becomes one of those outcomes. Us in the spiritual community, we try to explain this when we talk about timelines, and that's why I think it's important to know this stuff. Okay, so now Schrodinger was on Einstein's side. And he's like, no, no, no. Don't you use my equation for your crazy quantum theories. This is where we get into the famous Schrodinger's cat. Now this was not a real experiment. This was an example. He wanted to prove that these quantum theories were absurd in real life. Okay, so he said, you put a cat in a box. You put one radioactive atom in the box with the cat. Now that atom could decay or it could emit radiation. And he's like, so you're telling me the cat is neither dead or alive until I observe it? Now, Einstein loved this. He writes to Schrodinger and he's like, you're right, man. It's a risky game they're playing. Trying to say that reality isn't what we've proven it to be. Now, Dr. Kaku gives some really interesting insight. He says that even though these are really complex theories, this idea really does exist in our collective with the phrase, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around, does it make a sound? Okay, so now that we have nanotechnology, they're actually able to somewhat replicate this experiment, which is why now that this theory has more so evolved into the multiverse theory. Okay, but back to the drama, because this is 1935 in Europe. And we know what happened. Okay, so the Nazis are taken over. And majority of these people are in Germany and Austria. So Schrodinger sees Nazis attacking Jewish store owners and he tries to stop them. So they mess him up. And then one of the Nazis is like, wait, stop. That guy won the Nobel Prize. And now all these physicists are like, we got to get the hell out of here. Now Bohr was in Copenhagen. So he gets the Rockefeller Foundation to get the money together to get all of these physicists to Copenhagen. So then Max Planck, a German physicist, is like, whoa, 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 guys, don't leave. So he contacts Hitler. And he's basically like, if you love this country, you need to stop what you're doing because all the great physicists are leaving the country. And clearly we know Hitler did not care. So then Planck's son, Erwin, tries to assassinate Hitler. Clearly we know that didn't work, but badass attempt. So now the Nazis have his son and he writes this letter to Hitler like, please don't kill my son. So they do it anyway. And then they write parents unknown on his death certificate. Okay, so now some of these physicists like Warner Heisenberg took the promotion. And now him and some other people who are now working for the government discover that if you split a uranium atom, you could create the most deadly weapon ever known to man. 
So Einstein hears about this and he contacts the president, who at the time was FDR. And Einstein's like, yo, just telling you, you're about to lose this war because the Nazis are splitting atoms and it's gonna be bad and you better beat them to it. And this leads to the Manhattan Project, which was basically to beat Germany to building the atomic bomb. Now what's interesting is that Einstein was not allowed to work on the Manhattan Project because of his political beliefs. Einstein was a democratic socialist, so they never gave him the security clearance to be allowed to work on the project. And here's where things get really weird. Now, Werner Heisenberg was speaking at a conference in Italy about quantum mechanics. Little did he know there was an American spy in the audience, but this spy was a player for the Boston Red Sox. Mo Berg was an average catcher, but he was anything but an average man. He was literally a fucking spy. And they sent him to the conference and said, if there's any indication that they're going to beat us in this atomic race, then take him out. Now, it's believed that Mo Berg was a member of OSS, which was the CIA before the CIA. What makes this even weirder is that 10 years prior, when he was in Japan, he got into the tallest building and filmed and the U.S. government actually used that footage to decide where they were going to drop the atomic bombs. Moberg also spoke 12 languages, including Sanskrit. He also went to Yugoslavia to gather intelligence on resistance groups, which our government was planning on supporting. You know how we do. Okay, so the Manhattan Project ended up costing $2 billion, which is probably a trillion dollars today because groceries are freaking a billion dollars right now. And while we're gossiping, I bumped into Dr. Kaku in an elevator about 15 years ago. And I was like, hi, Dr. Kaku. And he went, oh, okay, sure. And we silently continued the elevator ride, which felt longer than it should have. <laughs>